Okay, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to our second uh, virtual a uh, animal science educational webinar series this evening. We are excited to talk about the precision agriculture or use of technology in uh, agriculture. So my name is Bernie O'Rourke and I'm the Extension Youth Livestock Specialist uh, here that works at UW-Madison in the Animal and Dairy Sciences Department. So uh, welcome uh, to our tonight's e or this evening's webinar. We're excited to be able to, to share with you three wonderful speakers that are uh, doing technology and agriculture each and every day. Uh, from different facets of the industry. So we're excited to be able to share with you um, all, all of you some, some ways that we're doing that, but then also some ways that if this is really a spark for you, this really interests you, that you could find a way uh, to maybe work it into your career path at some point. So we're gonna move right into just a few things of um, kind of the, the background of how to uh, operate a Zoom. Um, for this evening, we are running like what is called a webinar option. And so you won't be able to really talk or um, uh, be able to engage in that way, but you can through uh, your questions through the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen or the chat on the bottom of your screen. Um, if you can keep the questions Q&A in the Q&A the box, it just helps me sort it out as a speaker speak, then I can, um, you know, direct those questions their way, okay? Um, the other thing is, you know, this evening, uh, <laughs> I know we all love to engage through Zoom, um, but just to keep it, you know, moving forward and getting everybody's questions um, answered, let's have great listening skills and, and really leave the chat in the Q&A sections for questions. Um, if we get too many comments in there, then it's hard to keep track. Um, of all the questions that you guys ask, which are, are super great. And so uh, just try and keep them cleaned up if you can, uh, that would be great. Uh, the next thing, just to kind of give you a reminder here, uh, this week's again is kind of the theme is the grand challenges of, of agriculture and how we're working through how to, to solve them. Somehow that uh, got moved. Um, but next month is actually March 3rd. We had to change the date, um, but we'd love for you to join us. We're gonna be in our new meat science uh, biologics building on the UW-Madison campus. And we are going to be doing pork carcass evaluation. We're gonna be uh, going into retail cuts and uh, looking at all sorts of neat things around pork, pork cookery, and those types of things. So join us next month and then April and May are the, the next two on the list as we round out the spring uh, sessions. Um, we wanna do, uh, before we move on here, we wanna make sure we give special thanks to the Wisconsin Beef Council and the Wisconsin Pork Producers, um, as well as the National Pork Board. All of them have uh, produced and given uh, videos for us to access as it relates to each one of these grand challenges. So it really has been neat to see how Wisconsin producers engage in these types of grand challenges each and every day. It's not just people um, that work in the business sector or the research sector, it's people that are producing for food each and every day that are working within these grand challenges. So that's, that's pretty neat. Uh, and those of you who, um, if you uh, made sure you read through your emails that you would have received this evening to prompt you to make sure you attend, uh, there is an educational form you can download. Hopefully you've downloaded it already and have it printed and ready to make some great notes about what you've learned tonight and maybe what you'll take away from this evening's events that you can share with others in your county, uh, in school tomorrow, uh, with your ag teacher, um, anyone that's involved in your life that you wanna share of what you learned, I think would be a fabulous idea and make sure you fill this out. All right, so we're going to get started with our first. I'm going to stop the share, so better um, make sure I do this right. <laughs> stop share. Looks like I did that. And our first uh, speaker this evening is going to be Rex, uh, Dr. Rex. I'll, I'll just keep it short like that, if that's all right, uh, Rex. And 
and he comes from us from North Dakota State University. So NDSU buys in, right? And um, many of you are may, may not be familiar with uh, that agriculture uh, university up in the north. Um, it, I, I've been told it's cold. I've been to Fargo. It gets pretty chilly, but there's a lot of great work that occurs there. And we're super excited to have uh, Rex with us um, tonight. So I'm going to pass this over to him. Uh, he's going to talk really about some of the things he's messing around in research, right? He's kind of got that scientific uh, role at a university where he gets to play around and try and solve this problem or create some really neat things, inventions, um, or use existing inventions to, to move us along. So I'm going to pass this over to Rex. And Rex, thanks so much for being with us this evening. Thank you, Bernie. Uh, first of all, Bernie, can you hear me well? And uh, can you see my screen right now? Yes, everything's great. Yeah, you can okay. if you want to put it in presenter mode from the beginning. That might help fill the whole part with the. There you go. Perfect. Okay. All right. All right. So, thank you. Thank you for your introduction, Bernie. And good evening, everybody. And uh, like Bernie said, I'm. Uh, my name is Rex Sun, and I came from NDSU. Uh, go Bison, right? So I, I'm. I'm right here in Fargo, North Dakota, and. Uh, Tonight, I'm going to give you some um, um, some project I'm doing in livestock and in precision agriculture. Uh, I know today tonight the, the theme is precision agriculture. Tonight's topic is precision agriculture. I'll just give you a little background about this precision agriculture program at NDSU. Uh, so I'm an assistant professor in agriculture engineering department at NDSU. So about three years ago, uh, our our school launched an a major, a, pre, a major program called a precision agriculture. So what makes this program unique is we are one of the only two land grant university in the nation. So if you are a student, you want to go to the college you want to get a degree, we can give you a degree, a four year degree in precision agriculture. So that's pretty unique. So I'm the professor, I'm the assistant professor in this program. So. Uh, my research area is uh, pretty in uh, uh, pretty much in three areas: in crop and livestock and the food area. So before I uh, work in, as a assistant professor, I used to work in animal science department as an agriculture engineer uh, in uh, different technologies, uh, focus on livestock uh, study. So I think that's uh, tonight I'm going to uh, introduce a few of my ongoing livestock. Uh, um, project to you and hopefully make that uh, very interesting to you. So the technology I'm really into and uh, to work on is one is artificial intelligence, AI, and it's a big, it's a, you know, it's right now in every industry, right? In cars, automation cars, and um, uh, medical um, uh, areas. And now in, how about in farming area, we are using agriculture, artificial intelligence. So AI is my interesting area. The other one is robotics. And uh, tonight, I know tonight we are only talking about livestock. I hope in the future I can have an opportunity to talk about my crop side. I'm uh, building, uh, while well, my team is building uh, quite a few ver uh, different versions of uh, field robots right now in the crop side. And uh, we're trying to using this uh, different field robots to detect whether it's a crop disease or weed detections, there's lots of different applications. Very cool robots, actually. Um, and then the third one is remote sensing. And uh, we do have a different kind, lots of different kinds of drones, uh, fixed winds, uh, you know, uh, uh, ro rotors, and uh, lots of different shapes, uh, different kinds of drones, and to, to, to play around with, it, uh, with the researchers here uh, for the research project. But, uh, uh, next, let me introduce you the, the, the first one. Uh, the first uh, project I'm doing for livestock is using artificial intelligence to identify beef cattle face. So we know, you know, right now, whether you have an Apple phone or Android phone, you try to unlock that phone, you just uh, put that uh, uh, in front of your face and the face recognition, right? Using artificial intelligence. How about we are using that technology for beef cattle. So one of my graduate students, and he happened to be, he used to be uh, our NDSU beef barn manager. So 
I just, uh, you know, one day I visit pictures and um, I just use this, uh, uh, my cheap $300 Android phone. I just walked to the beef barn there and then just took a bunch of pictures of the beef cattle. And then uh, I came back and uh, import these pictures to my artificial intelligence algorithm. And actually I did this on my laptop. I just play around with that. I see if they, this artificial intelligence can recognize the beef cattle face uh, to match their uh, ID, their uh, air tag, right? So I asked my student that he, he used to be that uh, beef bar manager. Uh, his name is Billy. I asked him, Billy, um, do you know this, you know, is this AI technology uh, might beneficial for the beef cattle industry? And he said, well, this is pretty interesting because every morning he had to uh, grab a pen, uh, grab a, you know, grab a, 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 a notebook. Uh, do, when, when he do chores, he needs a record what cattle is coming to the, to the, uh, to the, uh, in the front to eat. If we can install some kind of camera and with AI system, he can just drive a four wheeler or something, you know, automatically recognize which cattle is coming to have a breakfast this morning and which cattle didn't come to have breakfast. In that case, maybe we, we, we might know the cattle who didn't come to have breakfast might be sick or something going on with, with, with that uh, cattle. So it might have a potential to, to do some cattle behavior and the cattle routine uh, detections. So that's just the uh, one applications uh, I'm doing. The other one is I'm using this uh, thermal imaging technology to predict the early stage of a respiratory disease. I know right now we are still in the, this uh, COVID uh, pandemic situation, right? I mean, actually I did this uh, um, uh, research, it's a funded research. I did this research even before the pandemic. We know we in, during the pandemic, if uh, people got sick or we, we got some, uh, some kind of, uh, you know, uh, we, for example, we got COVID and then we probably have a fever, right? And the, how to detect that fever and the lots of uh, uh, places they are using that, uh, uh, temperature uh, thermal imaging to detect that. So the same thing, I was actually using this before the pandemic. So we are trying to using uh, a handheld device. Here I have a picture to show you. So uh, we are trying to using a handheld device to take a picture of that cattle and uh, that device, that thermal imaging device can give you a thermal mapping. So the, on that picture, it can, not only tell you one spot of the temperature, they can give you a temperature map. So you can, if you want, you can take a picture of the whole cattle and then tell you the whole cattle's different uh, temperature spot. So hopefully, well, the, where, there's another study out there, out there is showing if a cattle have a respiratory disease, which is a big deal in beef cattle industry, 90, over 90%, that cattle have BRD, we call BRD, you know, the, the respiratory disease, they will have a fever, okay? So if they have a fever, how about we using this a thermal imaging technology, a thermal device to detect, detect that early signs of have a fever. So we can tell that rancher, hey, cattle ID 358 might have a fever, and then we can do something about it. Isolate that cattle, or do some treatment on that cattle, potential to save that, uh, you know, the cost of ranchers, okay, right? So that's another project I'm working on. The third one is using drones, of course, right? So in the precision agriculture, we have, uh, we have drones, different drones. And then this is one of my favorite drones. And um, we, this drone, we got it, we donated, we got do this drone had been donated by a company. And uh, this drone, can fly, uh, it can take off like a rocket. And then uh, when he reach out to a certain altitude, it become a fixed wing drone. So it can fly like a plane. So uh, when it's landing, it's also like a landing vertically, like a, like a, a rocket as well. So it's a, it's a very uh, a unique drone. But under that drone, we have different cameras. So that's, I just uh, literally took this uh, drone uh, last summer and flew 
one of our uh, extension, we call the extension center there. So they have some cattle that belongs to NDSU. And then we just, uh, I, I just grabbed that drone and it took off and then fly over that 150 feet. The cattle doesn't even care. There's a, they didn't even notice there's a drone above them. So, but uh, I can take a picture uh, above this drone, uh, above this uh, uh, cattle. We can do many things. One, maybe we can find the miss missing cows, right? In the summer, maybe on the pasture, uh, the, the grass is so tall. Maybe you, you maybe you can, we can attach a thermal camera to, to find that the missing, missing cows. That's one application. The other application I'm doing is I'm taking this picture and then look this, uh, using my artificial intelligence to inventory them, to, to count them. How many cattle is uh, uh, down on the pasture? Well, there is still some improvement. If you can see on this screen, my artificial intelligence algorithm can recognize most of them pretty good, but uh, look on the center of that, of the four, number 14. They recognize the two cows as one single cow. The why? Because that's a mama cow and a baby cow. They they stand together. They you know and they touch touch together. They they stand each other to eating grass, and then my imaging my technology is not accurate enough at least right now to separate them because they are they are connect each other. So how to improve my my artificial intelligence? To recognize those and to separate them, so that's in my next next step for this kind of research. The third, the, the next one, the last one I want to introduce is, I'm also doing some uh, beef temperament prediction using this uh, near infrared imaging technology. So, well, studies show that humans. I'm also uh, working with a psychology professor here at NDSU. Uh, he was working on human temperament. So studies showed if we go to movie theater to see a horror movie, and then if that horror, horror scene is coming up, our pupil will suddenly dilating. And then we, that's because we are so exciting. We are so horrified, right? But what about, that made me thinking, what about we are detecting this beef cattle's pupil, that eyeball to see if they are exciting or if they are calm down to measure, to find a, find a cool way to measure that beef temperament using this pictures to detect their pupil. So I did some research on that and uh, find some pretty interesting uh, results. And you can see the pupils of cattle is different than humans. Our human pupil is uh, just round, but, uh, but uh, for cattle is a rectangular shape. So, but uh, I have using this kind of imaging technology, we can we can measure the size, measure the size of their pupil. We can hopefully can predict that's an exciting cow. That's a pretty calm cow, cow, right? By doing that, so we can uh, we can correlate some data to even our product, like the steak you're eating. Maybe the more exciting, the, the cows have more exciting when they turn to your steak on the, on, on the plate, maybe their meat is not a taste, not, not so tasteful. So I'm trying to collaborate, uh, uh, correlate with the meat quality with the cow temperament together. So that's my last uh, uh, research I want to introduce you tonight. And uh, I don't know, Bernie, maybe uh, we will answer some questions in the end. Yeah, I think we will. But I think, um, you know, if somebody, there was a question, I think I added it in, uh, I, I did type in here. It's just something about like, um, so you're ch basically using, so your, your artificial intelligence is using the human face ID from iPhones, right? That technology to kind of do that in cattle and how yeah. maybe cattle features are a little different than human features. You know, maybe they're more similar right? Uh, uh, yeah. How many fi 500, you know, Angus cat, you know, calves going into a feedlot all have black faces, right? So, yeah. so how do you tell the difference? And I, I think that was what that question was about. So uh, I think you're absolutely right. I, it's only the algorithm difference, like 
for for humans, we are measuring the shape of your nose, uh, the, the length of your nose, the shape. Like uh, there are so many param parameters, so many uh, measurements on your face to recognize your unique face, right? Same like cattle, like uh, even it's the uh, same color, but their shape on the the forehead or you, their their texture features might be different. Their eye, their eye distance between the two eyes might be different. We can find some unique features or unique measurement to separate them. So that's my goal on the livestock side, on the on the beef cattle side. Okay, great, thanks, Rex. Um, I think we'll move to our next speaker, but please do continue to put some questions in the the Q and A. Uh, we can follow up with the the speaker um, towards the end. Um, the other. I think we'll have Justin next. So if you want to stop sharing Rex and I'll remove the spotlight and pick up Justin. So Justin comes from us uh, or comes to us from uh, Data Mars. Uh, it's, a, it's a company that's doing a lot of uh, fun and interesting things. And so I'm going to make sure he gets over to share his screen. And if you want to start talking, Justin, I will. Yes, Pam, can you see the screen? Yeah, I can. I'm yeah, going to try and remove the spotlight from, uh, from got too many windows open here. Hang tight, everybody. Uh, <clears throat> and, and to get Justin's um, video. So if you want to put your video on, Justin, if you think you can, are you worried about uh, Yes, no, actually, I was trying. Hang on just a second. Oh, sure. I think I had your spot. Your, there we go. I can, perfect. Yep. Yes, awesome. So we got you going. So I'm not yeah. going to uh, go through in too much detail introducing Justin. I think Justin probably will do a better job at that yeah. himself, but he's got a, a definitely a, a nation, uh, nationwide responsibility in working with Data Mars and is in charge of the smart farming aspect to their business. And so I'll turn it right over to Justin. Thanks for joining us tonight. Yeah. Thank you, Bernadette. Thanks for the time and excited to talk to everyone. And, you know, one of the things is thinking about new technologies, um, especially the different age groups and, and the different amount of opportunities that lay in career fields. Um, as, as they, you know, as you'd heard earlier, there's so many new things coming in the market from drones and, and different technologies. The company Data Mars I work for actually has, we're kind of around data gathering. So as, as he mentioned earlier, the different things that we can do to, um, to make our lives either, whether it's counting cattle, things like that. And, and that's similar to kind of what we do. A lot of the products we have is weighing systems or like scales that some of you may have. We have RFID tags that track and trace animals. We have identification tags, fencing and things like that. At about two years ago, Data Mars took the step as how can we move into the future and what can we do to start helping dairy producers be more efficient. And one of the things that we've been working on for the last three years is an activity monitoring system, and it's mainly focused in dairy. And what that is, is really similar to, um, you know, some of the things that we see in the industry now. And, and kind of going to the next slide, um, as we think about activity monitors, we think about Fitbits, right? So like a Fitbit or a smartwatch or something like that. And, and what we use those for there's a lot of different things. One is tracking heart rate. We track our workouts. Uh, we track food. There's a lot of things that we can do that helps us make better decisions as, as, as humans, right? And so you start to think about animals. What can we do to be able to, to track animals? And that's where we come up with the uh, smart tag. So it comes in a, a collar and a tag. And what it does, it just starts to build those algorithms real similar to what your watch would do. So you know, your watch can track your sleeping time, standing time, you know, how many steps you have a day. It would be no different than it would be in a, in a dairy cow. And what that starts to do is help us, you know, look at better ways to manage our animals. What can we do to be more efficient? And what can we do to make better business decisions, as he mentioned about, you know, milk quality, um, things like that. So how does it really work? So we talk about things for uh, adults or, or kids, it's no difference. There's five behaviors that it actually tracks. And what that tracks is standing time, lying time, and ruminating. So the cow that eats and they're laying there chewing their cud, 
and feeding and resting time. So what that starts to do is track that animal individually and starts to build algorithms around things if the animal feels sick or maybe he's not eating and things like that that we can do to identify issues or things that may help us make that animal live longer or do better. And how we do that, it's really cool that everything is actually put in through a the cloud as we hear on a lot of things that you guys use for storing files and things like that. It actually sends this information and in, in around algorithms is, is, as they mentioned earlier and machine learning. So it actually starts to learn that animal and it actually sends it, like I mentioned before, to your, your mobile phone. You can actually look at the cow um, with your phone right there and look at each individual cow. You can look at your computer and it starts to, like I said, build those different um, algorithms and things to help you make a better business decision. And who's really using this is dairy producers at this time. And a lot of times, you know, we're looking at producers are using it, your reproduction specialist, feed companies, different things in your local veterinarian to look at different things. And some of the things that it does, as you can see on the phone, um, it'll start to give you um, a reproductive performance. So you start to get notifications that that animal uh, needs to be artificially inseminated or needs to be serviced by a bull. One of the things that we really see in, in today's agricultural economy is really all about work, is finding people that's able to, to do the, the task at hand. And those efficiencies are really tough right now is finding people that they're gonna work in dairy barns, they're gonna do that. So what this helps do is actually eliminate um, some labor and time. So it makes us more efficient around checking cows, looking at cows, things like that. And it also, like I mentioned earlier, and how enhances cow performance. It just makes her overall healthier and overall better. Another way to do it is it identifies unhealthy cows. So you can get a alert on your phone as well or on your computer that identifies that. And like I mentioned earlier, one of the really neat things is you can look at it um, cow side. So, and where we're seeing this really start to advance is we're seeing, you know, we're talking about things now and we're really starting to learn just about this. It's been out for a few years and what we're starting to see is, is things that's gonna come about and we can learn from this, especially from some of the universities and some of the other studies that's going on around lameness, start to identify things. Um, also, you know, if a cow's out or, um, you know, one of the things he mentioned earlier, I even see this start to come even further is, is the satellite and GPS to where you're able to actually look at your phone at each individual animal, know if one's sick, if one's out of a pen, or if it's not coming to water, or maybe she had a, a calf. Um, so we, we continue to see this evolve. And I think over the next you know three to five years, it's even gonna continue to, to move um, leaps and bounds. When we start thinking about precision livestock or precision agriculture, as I mentioned earlier, you know, there's even, um, you can get a degree in that now. And when I was in school, it's, you know, pretty much animal science, pre-vet, things like that. But now is what we're seeing with all these new technologies, even with our, in our company, we have a research and development R&D department. We have machine learning. We have animal behaviors that work in our company that help to look for new technologies and, and things as well. Um, app designers, computer science people. So there's there's a lot of opportunities in this industry, especially as, as we continue to move forward. Um, you know, one of the things is, is obviously sales consultant, people that can go out and work with dairies, teach people how to use the products. Um, nutritionists to be able to understand how these products work. And we talked about rumination earlier, about the cow chewing her cud. So they can start to look at these animals and see, are they eating what they're supposed to? Are they going off feed? Um, and obviously, you know, veterinarians and farm managers, we need people that's going to continue to stay in ag and look at the other opportunities. I know when I was in school originally, uh, when it started, I really didn't realize the opportunities within agriculture, other than, you know, um, I thought being a feedlot manager or being a dairyman or a veterinarian, but there's so many different things that you can do even from the, uh, the business standpoint of the, uh, of the industry. So, you know, kind of what, what we see coming in the future, um, as he mentioned earlier, um, you know, there's some of the things we're working with now is, um, is camera technologies to be able to identify animals as they walk under into a dairy to start to look at body condition score um, and, and lameness. Um, one of the things that we'll be coming to the market soon with is walk over weighing. And it's, it's a scale system that the animal can actually walk over 
daily, not even have to stop. And it builds an algorithm and gives us daily weights on that. And, and where all this fits together, um, as we talk about all these different technologies, is how to tie them together to make better business decisions around weighing. You start getting milk weights, you start getting camera technology, and you start getting these algorithms with these wearables and Fitbit type products. You can start to really understand how the animals really behave and, and, and make us more efficient and, and more effective. And, and we start talking about the sustainability, right? So sustainability and long-term with a consumer demand, they want a product that they know the animal's been taken care of and that they, they've been treated fairly. And, and I think a lot of these technologies are gonna help us um, on the consumer side in the, in the future. So that's all I have. Great, thanks, Justin. There's a couple of questions um, in the uh, in the chat or the Q and A. You know, the constant question I'm sure you get is, so what if your internet's bad or slow? How do these types of technologies work uh, on yeah. farms, or what are some adaptions that you all work through? That's a great question. So our our um, activity monitors at this time, they're actually Bluetooth and go to what we call a gateway. A gateway would be similar to, um, it looks kind of like a, a Wi-Fi hub, right? Or, or your, your Wi-Fi router that you have in your house. And there's different ways that those work. There's like one is, is, as you mentioned, Wi-Fi or hardwired. Also can be, um, um, sorry, my mind went blank, was 4G or cell phone signal. A lot of the dairies we work with now are in remote areas. Um, and, and what you find most of the dairies at this time have internet, mainly um, satellite signal or they have it shot from a tower further away because they're using um, other types of products out there that, that require that. But uh, if it does go offline, the good thing is um, the data actually stores on the, the tag from 12 to 24 hours. So if you did have a disruption um, in service, it, it does store that data and provide it later. So great question. Yeah, um, the next one is, so the, those monitors, they act, so basically the Fitbits on the cows, how do they stay charged or what's the, the length of charge or life that you have on a particular cow for those, those little fit bands? Yeah, nice question as well. So um, obviously the battery, we have two different options as you saw earlier, the one with the ear tag. And it's a very small um, a tag that's, that's um, you know, doesn't really get in the way. It lays on the ear really nice. It lasts three, at least three years is our guarantee. And then the collars, which looks like a, um, I always say a watch around a cow's neck, right? It's, it's a, it's a larger, um, about the size of a cell phone, maybe a little smaller and thicker. It'll last five to seven years. Okay. Um, coming along with the same or a similar question. And I, and, um, the question's around, can you use this in other animals? You kind of really made your comments related to dairy. I know that's a lot of yeah. work that your company has been doing. Is there other species of livestock or animals that this is used in? Yes, um, currently um, there is a lot of studies in the beef side. It's mainly around confined animals because what, what we're running into in technologies as they evolve, um, most of these tags have to talk to a, or collars rather, have to talk to a receiver and most around 500 to 1,000 meters. So um, they typically have to be, you know, dry lotted or in confinement areas. There is some work in the beef side now on pasture animals, um, which I think, you know, with some of the universities and trials in the next five years, we'll have it where um, it can actually, you know, uh, track further off. But I know some of the companies now um, are launching some beef, but what we run into a lot of times is is the actual cost of the product. When you start talking feedlot animals and what what that animal sells for and how much margins made, it, it becomes a little harder to um, find value in that versus a, a, a dairy cow that's going to be in your herd for maybe you know three to five years or longer. Yeah, this is a good question from Jameson. Um, can this be used in pigs? Obviously, pigs are maybe a little rougher on tags. We, you know, tend to have used ear notches over the years with, with mm -hmm. pigs. And, you know, so can you talk uh, or speak to any use in the swine area? Yes, yeah, so there has been, um, there has been some trials in, in swine. Um, most of it has been more, um, 
it's it's more in the in the piglet side, right? It's where we're seeing in, in behaviors there. Um, at this time, there's really not a lot out there, and one of the reasons is a lot of your your feeder your feeder pigs and those sort um, they don't seem to like to put tags in them. So um, when you talk about quality of pig ears that's sold in other countries and and the sheer amount of labor and cost, it, it's not really been a, a much of a focus at this time. But I think something as we move in the future, it could be. Okay, and I think there's one question. I'm going to read it quick. Do you, do you have to adjust the settings of the tag based on the animal? Will it track differently for different breeds, sexes, weights? So, like calves versus, you know, gestating cows versus lactating cows. Perfect. That's a that's great a, question. That's a, actually, that's a, yeah, that's a great question. So, here's the here's the neat thing. Our um, that tag that you put on that animal. It typically takes three to four days to start to build that actually habit of that animal. So it starts to look at the norm, right? So if the animal's laying a lot or standing, it starts to really learn that animal and understand that animal. And then it adapts to that animal and starts looking for, so you think an algorithm. So it's kind of like us. So I'll use the example, you know, um, you feel good, you're, you're active, you're moving, you're on your feet, you're eating good. Um, but maybe, you know, you start to feel bad. W what do we typically do? We, we maybe don't eat as much. Uh, we lay around. We're not, you know, we're not standing. We're lying more. And then that's what happens. It starts to identify each, indiv each individual animal that way. And we also look at it from a, a group perspective. So you look at it as a, a pen of animals, but then also each individual animal that starts to identify. Great question. Yeah. And I think we'll end with this last one because there was just two that came in. So how much does one of these cost? So how much are you out if it if it falls out or you lose it? So yeah, great. Uh, another good question. Um, so as far as falling out or losing, there is a um, a guarantee on the on the products, um, and most companies that that'll you know that work with that do warranty or have um, protection there. It's typically somewhere around that fifteen to twenty dollars per cow per year. It's typically. Um, the, the average, I would say, cost across the board. Okay, great. Well, I, there's a bunch more questions coming in. I think it's they're they're great, and you've definitely got them thinking, uh, Justin. And and so, yeah. but I think we got to move to the next um, speaker. And I might just share these questions with Justin, and in his free time in the next few days, I, if he could send some responses, I might send that out if you're willing, Justin. Oh, most uh, definitely. Yeah, okay, because they are some really good ones, and um, I we're gonna Justin's going to be leaving us because he's been traveling all week. So um, we want to appreciate him and thanks so much for for being able to join us, Justin. Lots of great information. We're excited to to see what all is happening on how we can uh, use these tags to improve productivity, improve animal care, lots of cool stuff that's happening yeah. uh, with this technology. So thanks so much, Justin. Thank and, you. Uh, and I, I would recommend, yeah. you know, if you are interested and you uh, want to learn more um, YouTube, there's a lot of videos, not with just even ours, but a lot of um, competitive products and different things. Um, there's a lot of cool stuff out there. Get on YouTube, look at, um, you know, um, activity monitors for cows um, it, it's, it's really, uh, really a neat product. So I want to thank everybody for their time and, and Bernadette, thank you as yeah. well. Yeah. Thanks again, Justin. So if, um, I'll see if I can spotlight you, Joe, here we go. So Joe, thanks for joining us from John Deere. Joe from John Deere is with us <laughs> tonight. And, uh, we're excited to hear about the, these, these tractors that drive themselves. It's, it's kind of timely. We've, we just had that big announcement, what, a couple of weeks ago. And, and so we're excited to have Joe from uh, John Deere as a product manager for them in their autonomy area to, to just give us some really cool things about what's happening with tractors and, and the, the big technology that gets us crops to feed our livestock too. So thanks to Joe for being with us. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for the opportunity. And, and you're right, at the Consumer Electronics Show in January, we revealed our first uh, fully autonomous 8R. Uh, that'll be coming to farmers fields this fall um, in a limited release fashion. And so we've been developing it really over the last several years as we focused on, on getting autonomy into the farm fields. Um, but if we think about precision agriculture, and we just heard about some really cool tech from, from Rex, and, Rex and Justin, um, 
But if we look a little bit at, I'll call the modern history of, of precision ag, um, in the early 1900s was really when tractors first came to the farm and, and started then to, to replace, you know, horses in the, in, on the fields. And then really in the early 2000s, right, and this is a look of deer's history of precision ag, but in early 2000s is when we started to see precision ag as we know it today evolve. Um, and we've got GPS satellites, section control, um, you, you know, really things that started to assist the human while, while they're out driving, driving in that machine. And then as you, you start to think about some of the last couple of years, you're starting to see technology that can do a better job than a human. And so it's starting to create superhuman capabilities through automation and new technology. Um, and then really now, as we think about what's coming next, you know, machine learning is, is really the next step for precision agriculture to continue to drive things forward, right? And that'll be what makes, makes these machines superhuman. Um, but, but so let's get into autonomy, how deer's delivering autonomy. And I thought I'd start off with just uh, playing a video that'll, that'll really highlight it from a farmer's point of view of uh, what's gonna be available in, in the field this fall. You start out in the spring, you work the soil, and it just smells so fresh. When you till it up, and it's just the greatest smell. When I started farming, there basically was no technology. Every tractor was driven manually, everything was done manually. You'd be planting, you had to follow a line. If the sun was wrong, you would lose the line. Darkness, you couldn't see your marks. Moisture, you couldn't see your mark. Then you'd get squiggly rows. My name is Doug Nims. I'm a farmer from Blue Earth, Minnesota. I'm a fourth generation farmer, and I raise approximately 2,000 acres of corn and soybeans. I really never thought I would see an autonomous tractor in, in my farming career. For me, it was really exciting the first time I got to take the autonomous tractor to the field, swipe my phone, watch the tractor start with no one in the cab, start doing tillage, come to the end of the field, turn on the end, do the tillage just as well as I can do myself with no one in the cab. I can pull up the app, I can monitor the tractor, see how much of the field it's gotten tilled, I can check the fuel level, I can check the app to see how much of the field is left. If there was something in the field that it wasn't sure about, the tractor will stop and alert me. Is this something I can go around? Do I need to go out and remove an object from the field? The app gives me all this information so I can monitor everything very closely. On farms, labor is always a challenge. We need labor for lots and lots of hours for short periods of time. The auto steer and technology has helped reduce our labor load, which makes my life a lot easier. Autonomy will help because we will be able to put a tractor out in the field and let it run for 24 hours a day because it's not manned. But it also helps us with the weather because we can run so hard when soil conditions are fit. The thing that excites me the most about autonomy is not be locked in the tractor cab all day. It will just allow me to run my business better because I can just pay closer attention to other tasks. Now we'll be doing the jobs that we always wanted to get done but never had time to because we were in the cab all the time. Farmers are fairly traditional, but I have a feeling that once they try it, they will become very accepting of it. I think the tractor can do a better job than I can do. Autonomy, uh, it's, uh, it's gonna be a life changer for me.
Awesome. Well, I love I love that video every time I, I, I watch it still. Um, and I think, you know, Doug Nims has been a cooperator with us at, at John Deere for the last several years as we've been developing this this product uh, really with him on his farm and with farmers like him uh, here here in the upper Midwest. And so um, as Justin highlighted, too, in his, in, in his uh, presentation earlier, right, farm labor is a challenge. Finding folks that are interested to, to work on the farm is a challenge, as well as the need to get multiple things done at once. And so as we talk to farmers, uh, one of the things they're asking for is autonomy as another tool to help them be more efficient, be more sustainable, uh, and ultimately also be more profitable by getting the job done in a timely fashion. And so uh, what you see on the screen here, right, is the start of, uh, we started with an, a, a stock 8R, right? An 8R that you could find in a farmer's machine shed today. And then we add uh, more technology to it in the form of these camera pods at the front of the tractor. There's also one at the top of the, the cab around the back. And inside of those, those camera pods is, a, is three pairs of stereo cameras on the front, three pairs of stereo cameras on the back. Uh, along with uh, a video processing unit that's really powered by a, an NVIDIA Jetson GPU. And so that is where we house our machine learning algorithms that really start to classify uh, the world around us. But but also before we get into more cameras, if you think about this this 8R, it's already equipped with with telecommunications, right? The tractor is connected to the cloud. There's machine data and agronomic data that's passed from, from tractor to cloud and then and then cloud to farmer uh, and allowing them to manage their data, manage their operation um, from, from anywhere. And so the tractor's already got the connectivity. It also has our, our GPS guidance technology on it. So we've got 20 years of self-driving with farmers around our auto track products and our ability to do turn automation uh, and implement control, implement guidance with, with, uh, with the GPS technology. And so what we never had before was, was camera technology to really perceive the world around us and let the farmers step out of the tractor for the first time. So then what you're, what you're seeing highlighted here is how we take these six pairs of stereo cameras uh, that have an overlapping field of view that see not only around the tractor, but also the implement or the job that we're doing and allows us then to, to truly safeguard the system and understand if there's any exceptions around us as this machine works in the field. And so it's designed to be autonomous in the field. Uh, a farmer's gonna manually transport it to the field. They're going to do some quick setup in the command center, and then they're gonna step out of the cab, pull out their smartphone and through our John Deere Operations Center mobile application, uh, they will then approve motion and really control this tractor as it completes a job for them in the field. Um, they're free to leave the field and go do something else, whether that is another job on the farm, maybe it's back home uh, on, on farm site, spending more time with their livestock, with their family, or doing something in the community. So it's really going to give them freedom to manage their time uh, outside of the tractor cab. And while they're away from the, the job in the field, right, they're still going to need to monitor it to make sure it, it's uh, the way they do. But we're also computer vision, not only to classify the world around us, but we're also looking to understand, is there any job quality issues? Um, in the case of, of tillage, we're looking for, say, plugs in the, in the, the tillage tool behind us. Um, we're also looking for any kind of machine health issues, right? So did we hit a subsurface rock and did we break a shank? So we're going to be able to start to detect that using camera technology now going forward. Um, and all of this is designed to be, again, it's designed to be retrofitted on, on, a, on a tractor and say a John Deere implement that's in a farmer's machine shed today. Um, so it's, it's also going to, going to help the adoption curve of, of this kind of technology because you're not going to have to go out and buy a new, say, uh, brand new tractor or especially purpose-built vehicle that can only be used for autonomy. Uh, you can put autonomy on your existing tractor and then still use it as, a, as an existing tractor, right, and, and manually perform operations. Maybe too, just to dive into some of the tech a little bit deeper here. Um, this is kind of highlighting what the camera sees. And so if you think about the four views at the bottom of the screen, on the left would be, be a raw image. Um, and then in the, in the bottom view, it's coming up to a trash can. It's timed with, uh, with the, in the field, like seeing a rock out in that field. 
Uh, but the first view is the raw image and, and a farmer could access this at any time and see live video on their cell phone. They can access any of the six camera feeds. Uh, but the second image is something new and novel that we're doing. It's predicting depth with stereo cameras and predicting depth uh, from stereo cameras isn't new, but the way we're approaching it is we're actually using machine learning to train our own depth model to get uh, very, very accurate geospatial locations of objects in front of us. If you think about why that matters, right, farmers work uh, around objects all the time with their equipment, whether it's a power pole, a fence line, uh, a tree line, right? They expect to be able to get close uh, to their equipment so they can grow the most crop possible. And so we need to be accurate with our depth projection so that the tool can work alongside that same power pole. The third image from the left uh, really shows how we're classifying the world. We look for drivable terrain, which is which is highlighted or in the green color. Uh, we, we classify trees, which is in, in red, and we classify sky in blue. And then really we're looking for anything else that isn't navigable terrain. And we think it's, a, it's, a, it's an object, right? So it shows up in yellow as a large object. Um, and on the, on the right side is the, the very last image to the right is, is a confidence, right? So the more cyan or more blue it is, the higher confidence for predicting the class correctly. Um, there's always going to be a little bit of uncertainty as you transition from drivable terrain to, to trees to sky. But then, right, we're seeing an object that we do not know what it is in the field, right? And so there's, there's uh, uncertainty around that, that large object. And then as we see more pixels, we gain more confident that something uh, is in the field that's unexpected. We'll bring, we'll bring the tractor to a stop. Um, and then we'll be able to alert the farmer through a push notification that, hey, there's something expected in your field and we need you to make an operational decision. And so um, that's really the, the, the new tech that's inside of our autonomous tractor, right? It's computer vision, machine learning. Uh, and leveraging stereo cameras to perceive the world around us. That gives the farmer the confidence to step out of the tractor cab. And then it's using some of the, again, it's the existing precision ag technology that they're used to with, with guidance and auto track. And so, you know, this view would be right, what a farmer would normally sit in, uh, say all fall long or all spring, spring while they're doing field preparation work. You know, but really now we can allow them to, to step out of the cab, go do something else, um, and really be a force multiplier for them on the farm and do two things at once, right? And again, that could be their livestock or it could be, could be with their family. And then just to echo a little bit what, uh, what Justin highlighted, right? If you think about the opportunities in, in agriculture, um, you know, it's not only in the, the machine design, right? mechanical design, but we've got folks working in data science. We've got folks working around sustainability with, with uh, new precision ag technology, um, but also then uh, computer science roles. So the opportunities is really endless out of agriculture. And we're, we're also hoping that as we bring higher tech uh, to the farm, right? We can we can interest more people to either go work on the family farm or stay on the family farm uh, to keep those legacies alive. So, just wanted to again share share a little bit about what we just introduced or, or revealed at the Consumer Electronics Show, and and again keep keep your eye out. This will be on Farmers Field starting uh, starting this fall in a, in a limited release fashion. That's great, uh, Joe. Thanks so much. There's there's a bajillion amount of questions in here. I don't know <laughs> we're going to get to them all, but I mean, just maybe just before we get into the questions, can yeah. you just dive in a little bit about your career path and how you got to John Deere? Like what was your school sure. in, um, like in high school and then, you know, what your interests were and then how you moved that into to maybe a university or a, a, some kind of degree path that you were on. Can you share that, please? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Would love to. Thanks for asking. And so, grew up in in Southern Illinois in uh, what uh, we would call a hobby farm today. Um, but uh, so I grew up in the country, and, and my dad's an owner operator, uh, semi truck driver. Um, so always grew up around around animals and, and agriculture. Um, and so very interested in mechanical things in school. I wanted to go because I thought I wanted to go uh, design cars. Um, but once I got to college and, and uh, started uh, looking at companies that were recruiting, I went to Missouri University of Science and Technology in Rolla, Missouri, uh, and got a mechanical engineering undergrad degree. Uh, saw, saw John Deere and, and uh, went and talked to them and, and did an internship with John Deere and just loved it and loved the, 
the opportunities uh, inside of ag and inside of deer. And so uh, I came to deer then really right out of, out of uh, college and been with them ever since. I've been with deer for a little over 16 years and I've, I've had a, a tremendous opportunity to do uh, a variety of things with my, my engineering undergrad degree. I've worked in you know, manufacturing, I've worked in operations, I've worked in product design, I've worked in supply chain. Uh, and then most recently I've been doing um, business development for John Deere. And then ultimately uh, the last several years, what, uh, what I'm doing now, which is product management. So I've worked a lot with our self-propelled super business globally, um, and bringing new technology to that product. And then the last several years, uh, I've been a product manager for autonomy here as we're, we're working to bring this, this tech to, to farmers. And so really my job is, is super fun in my mind, right? Everybody thinks they've got the most fun job, but, but honestly, my job is to go out, talk to farmers, understand some of their pain points, look for ways that, that John Deere or really technology can help them solve those pain points. And then I work with engineering teams to take those customer needs and translate them into to product requirements. Um, and then I get to also go back and take that product to farmers to make sure it's meeting their needs uh, as we commercialize it. So uh, I've had, a, had the opportunity to do a, a bunch of different stuff with deer. That's great. That's great. Thanks for summarizing that. I appreciate that. That gives everybody kind of a sense of what they might want to do when they grow up type of thing. <laughs> and as and as you talk about those pain points, you know, here in Wisconsin, we feed a lot of we feed a lot of dairy cows. And so we we put up a lot of hay. So one of the questions is, is, is haying going to be uh, a, a possibility with this autonomy thing? Boy, we could put up a lot of hay without having to manage it. Um, <laughs> any ideas or thoughts down that road? <laughs> yeah, no, no, great question, right? And, and ultimately, you know, what you, what you just saw here, right, what I shared is the start of our autonomous journey. Um, and we, we started with, with fall tillage because that's where farmers said they had one of the biggest, biggest bottlenecks. But you will see us now as we go forward, continuing to qualify more tractors and more jobs on the farm uh, to be fully autonomous, as well as uh, exploring new machine forms, right? So what comes after the tractor implement to be, to be a fully autonomous operation? So we'll work with growers to, to prioritize that roadmap, but absolutely look for, for more jobs to, to come. And, and uh, the dairy and livestock is a, is a, a segment that absolutely is, could, could see some autonomy in, in the near future. Yeah, that's great. There's a couple of questions related to just kind of how you got here. Obviously, that timeline you showed was super great. But yeah. uh, can you speak to just kind of really the tri you know, trials that you did the last number of years? I, I spoke with Joe earlier. I'm from southern Minnesota, not far from where they did a lot of their, uh, you know, trying out and driving in, in fields. So um, I knew Doug, or I know Doug, the, the farmer that was on the video. So that was kind of a neat small world. But can you speak to really that, you know, yeah. spending that time in the fields and how long that took you to kind of get to where you were or where you yeah. are? Yeah, absolutely. Right. And, and, you know, maybe the first thing I would say is like the, the technology you saw on the tractor, right. The new camera pods that, that sensor suite, right. Didn't exist a couple of years ago. Right. So technology is evolving incredibly fast, but in late 2018, we, we, uh, started about, uh, delivering autonomy to market. We started looking at some sensor selection, um, and we went out and we, we started taking some images in farmers fields, but then in 2019, we, we spun up a team, uh, and got serious about it. And so since 2019, uh, forward, we've collected over 50 million images from farmers fields all across the U S. Um, and of those 50 million images, we'll, we'll downsample that. We use about 150,000 images to train our, our uh, machine learning algorithms to classify the world around us. And then we're always continuing to, to, to collect new images and look for new and interesting data to train the model to make it even better. But if you think about it in 2019, our, our goal was to really, you know, till a few acres, right? And do it one acre at a time or do it 10 acres at a time is how we got started. Um, in, in 2020, right, we were, we were progressing to hundreds acres at a time. And then this past fall running with cooperators in, in uh, the Minnesota, South Dakota area, right? We were, we were focusing on doing thousands of acres with them and really doing their complete uh, fall tillage program for them. And so, um, Technology progresses very, very rapidly, right? And we're staying on top of that just as well as the, the development in this space where you can combine software and hardware products in the field. Um, you, can, you can really move, move fast and rapidly evolve. 
Uh, one question, uh, do, how do the cameras do in dusty conditions? Um, so field work and, yeah, and how, they yeah. how do they perform? Yeah, absolutely, right? And so ultimately a stereo camera, you can think about it as the human eye, right? And just like you blink uh, or look out of your left left image or, or right retina, right, to, to do depth location, that's exactly how our, uh, a stereo camera pair works as well. But then if you think about it, right, in dusty conditions, the human eye cannot see through dust, right? And so cameras have a, a challenge seeing through dust. And so uh, we can tolerate, I'll call it some amount of dust, right? Obviously, we're working in an agricultural environment. We're working outdoors. We're, we're working with the soil, right? So we, we're creating some dust in the air. But ultimately, if you're going to be in a super windy day with, with really light soils and it's blowing, I'll call it, into the tractor or with the direction of travel, um, and if we get a, a, a dust cloud around us, right, we're not going to be able to safely work because we can't see through it. Um, but that also means there's new sensor modalities uh, on the market. There's new sensor technology available. You know, we're continuing to look at, at do we need additional sensors to help aid us in those, those different conditions. And just like, as you mentioned, going into dairy and livestock, as we go into maybe some other environments or job conditions, you know, we'll look to see how does radar and LIDAR help us uh, in, in the, the different production systems that we're going to work in. Okay, great. Um, I mean, there's a lot more questions here. Um, and yeah. It's eight o'clock. I, I, I don't want to go over in time because I know everybody's time is valuable. Um, I'll end with this one last question because he put it in a couple of times. Um, Dale wants to know, you know, will this work on, on older tractors and then uh, tractors that are not John Deere? So uh, where is the technology in that place? And that'll be our last question. And then I if, if you don't mind, uh, Joe, I, there's a couple of, there's a bunch of really good ones. If I can send them yeah. to you and just give us a, a quick, maybe blurb about them, I'll send it sure, out for with, sure. the, with the registrants and they would love that. So I'll yeah, let you for, answer for the sure question. We, we can. Yeah, no, we, we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll do a follow-up Q, Q and A uh, that I can, I can document some responses. So question, two questions there, right? Of does it work with older tractors? And then does it work with, with non deer tractors? So I'll do the second question first. Um, so we are developing it for uh, compatibility only with John Deere tractors. Um, and we're going to, we're going to stay focused there for the foreseeable future. Um, just as I mentioned, right, there's a tremendous amount of opportunity in uh, production agriculture for grains, dairy and livestock, um, and even think about, right, the construction and forestry markets that John Deere serves. So we've got a tremendous amount of products in our portfolio that we could bring autonomy to if, if our customers want it. Uh, and then the first question was, all right, does it work with, with older tractors? And so um, it will work with, with late model tractors is our intention. So the um, the 4020 that might be in the shed or, or even, even the, the, you know, the 8400 um, that, that was built in the 1990s, right? Our intention is to not to go that far, far backwards from a compatibility standpoint. I mean, it's, it's, it's really limited by the, the electrical architecture or the CAN bus backbone that, that's on that older equipment. And so we'll need some modern electronics uh, to pair with then the new uh, computer vision technology to, to build that, that fully autonomous solution. But, but again, you do not have to be going out and buying a new 2022 tractor uh, to, to make it work. So there'll be late model tractors and farmers machine sheds that this will both up to. All right. Well, great. Thanks so much, Joe. And Rex, uh, if you want to uh, put your camera on too, and um, the, the night went fast, <laughs> the hour went fast. So I appreciate both of you tonight. And um, there are a couple of two here, I think, Rex, for you that I might just send off to you if that's okay to answer and written or even through a video would be great. But um, I want to personally thanks, thank you so much for taking the time tonight to, to, uh, be on with us. And I think the, the, you know, future is exciting as it relates to what we're going to be looking for and uh, from technology in the future. I, I'm excited. Lots and lots of neat opportunities. I just want to remind everybody of the upcoming sessions. Um, please make sure to just go back to that one web page that has everything on there um, and look forward to seeing you in the next upcoming ones. I will put the links to some of the videos that Joe shared um, through John Deere's YouTube channel. There's a bunch of videos on there. I'll put a link over to their uh, playlist and um, that'll be on 
this website that is at gowisk.edu that backslash TNQ at 61H. So thanks everybody. Uh, pleasure to have Joe. It's been a great experience meeting you, Joe, and uh, through this interaction and Rex as well. Have a great evening, everyone, and uh, we'll see you in March. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you.